Welcome to Illinois Lawmakers' continuing coverage of the spring session of the Illinois General Assembly during the month of May. I'm Jack Titchener, joined by State House correspondent Hannah Meisel, who is a contributor to Rich Miller's CapitalFacts.com. Good to have you on the program. Glad to be here. This week, of course, uh, there's some cautious optimism around the building in terms of getting a budget done by May 31st. What are you hearing? Yeah, no, it seems, uh, you know, when you think back to a year ago at this time, it's really the best that we could expect at this point in May, um, you know, considering the years now of uh, you know, bad blood that has grown between, uh, I would say the parties, but really specifically between Governor Bruce Rauner and uh, House Speaker Mike Madigan. And so it seems like they could definitely come to some sort of an agreement. Um, I feel like it's more optimistic than uh, anyone was quite expecting. Um, you know, the numbers don't seem to be terribly out of whack from uh, what the nonpartisan um, Commission on uh, Commission on Government budget. Forecasting mm -hmm. Accountability have, um, you know, calculated in what the state might bring in. And so, you know, there's not going to be, hopefully, not going to be too many snags there. So it could be smooth sailing, but I'm not going to place all my chips on the table yet. Exactly. And there were some fireworks here earlier in the week mm -hmm. when the governor issued an amendatory veto on a, gun, a piece of gun legislation that basically rewrote a lot of that bill. And he inserted bringing back the death penalty for mass murderers and police killers. Yeah, this was a um, very, very interesting move by the governor. Um, it's not something he has really talked about all that much before. Um, you know, the, the Democratic controlled legislature put out a bunch of gun bills in February and was it March in response to the shooting in Parkland, Florida. And um, this specific bill that the governor rewrote, it would have been a 72 hour cooling off period, um, you know, between the time that you want to go and buy a handgun and before you actually can. What he did was expand it from not just handguns to all guns, but then in the same uh, a stroke of the pen, he also said, you know, we're going to bring back the death penalty, something that uh, was officially abolished in 2011. And mm -hmm. so that's a, that's a really hard sell. I just saw where the House sponsor of the original legislation is mm -hmm. kind of shocked by it, but he says, well, we're going to talk to everybody and go through this thing and see how it works out. There's also a new development this weekend that uh, they're trying to get a separate appropriations for the uh, appropriation, capital appropriation mm -hmm. for the Quincy Veterans Home to, re to basically replace the whole thing. Right, and that would be, I mean, a standalone capital bill that would ensure that uh, things wouldn't be caught up in the political mire and then you know people could be uh, feel safer um, because as we remember uh, 13 people were killed by legionnaires disease and it's been terrible for not just the residents there but the governor's administration has not look, come out looking good at all um, you know the governor's demand that it's a separate standalone capital bill that takes away some leverage from Democrats but you know President Cullerton said the other day that he would be open to it. And we're going to hear a little later in the program that uh, there, there seems to be some bipartisan agreement on that. Hannah Meisel, thank you so much for your time on Illinois Lawmakers. Good to have you here. Okay. And uh, coming up next, we're going to start talking to some of the House budgeteers about how that budget may be coming together here at the Capitol. Are Illinois lawmakers any closer to getting a budget done by the end of May? Well, we're going to talk to one of the House uh, budgeteers on that, Republican uh Dan Brady of Bloomington. He's a deputy House Republican leader. Good to have you back on the program. It's nice to be here. Thanks for having me. Well, there was a leaders meeting this week, mm -hmm. and uh, I didn't hear of anybody throwing dead cats at anybody. So it, it, it was considered uh, to be very productive by all accounts. What are you hearing? What I'm hearing is, is that I'm optimistic. I continue to be optimistic. Uh, in these times uh, that we're in right now, uh, we know that there's a lot of uh, frustration level. Uh, there's a lot of pressures on everybody uh, regarding the budgetary process. But what's encouraging to me is that the discussions continue and that the leaders keep meeting and that our budgetary group keeps meeting. And uh, we're, we're moving, even though we, we didn't have a consensus on that revenue number that many Republicans, myself included, wanted to have, uh, we're still moving forward and we're into a position to where, you know, we're looking at uh, agencies um, and uh, the discussions continue. And at this stage of things, I think that's 
that's very positive. Um, I've been here in years past when the whole thing came down to uh, right before midnight and they actually stopped the clocks to mm -hmm. get the budget passed. So yes. at this point, we're a couple of weeks out from May 31st and to have these, uh, this kind of discussion still going at a, in a positive way is not insignificant. No, it's not insignificant at all. And that's, that's the encouragement that, uh, that I'm actually spreading. And that's in part why we're having our discussion here today. Now, can things change uh, in a minute? Sure, around here. Everybody knows that. But right now, the, the positive is let's keep riding the, uh, the wave of what appears to be uh, good faith negotiations, and we'll continue that. There, you know, sometimes is, well, the Democrats are slow walking this, or the Republicans aren't giving us the bills to get the thing together. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of rhetoric that flies around here, but from what you're saying, though, there's some substantive work happening below the sight lines. There is, and you know what? That work has to uh, really uh, go below the radar screen in order to keep getting things moving along. And so uh, the reports are encouraging my interaction with my colleagues. Do, do we have some bumps? Sure, we have some bumps, but uh, that happens when you're trying to put together a massive budget and you're trying to, to uh, be uh, identified the pressures that are on uh, so many different parts of our budget and the question of the revenue. And so with that, uh, we continue. But the blueprints, uh, blueprints in place from what the governor did, uh, obviously, we've got to continue to build on that. And the heavy lifting was done last year, whether you know you agree with the tax increase or not. It's in place. There's no appetite to do another increase during an election year uh, at, at all. So you're going to have to find a, a number to agree on Correct. and make everything conform to it. True. And I, and I think you bring up a very good point. And that is just simply that. It is an election year. And the flip side of that election year is that uh, there's now one rank or file, a Republican or Democrat, that wants to go back to the legislative district during election year and explain why we have no budget. And we're also in a, a situation this week where we're hearing some uh, really interesting stuff on gun control. The governor, of course, earlier this week uh, issued an amendatory veto that kind of rewrote one of the original bills. Uh, he's got that out there. And he, he wants to reinstate the death penalty for mass murderers and people who kill police officers stirred up a lot of controversy is that going to is that going to uh uh, uh, succeed here, or, or where, where are we going to well, go with that? Well, time will tell. One thing's for sure, though, with the uh, f the issue regarding gun control and the issue of what we've seen and the shootings that have occurred across this country, and uh, even most recently in Dixon, Illinois, thank goodness it turned out the way that it did. Um, we have to be cognizant of the fact of some of those points that the governor put in as a mandatory veto. Some of those ideas have been a work part of a working group of Republicans, some of those ideas. But looking at the school side of things, school safety side of things and looking at what we can do, especially uh, in the area of mental health and preventing. Uh, that's where our focus is. And so uh, the rest of it will play itself out, but uh, we'll see what, what happens with the response to the governor's mandatory veto and some of the things that he put in. Some good, some not so good in people's opinions. And the Senate, of course, is sending another uh, revised bill over here on gun licensing. Does it answer a lot of the concerns that were raised when it was vetoed earlier? That's a very good question because that's something that as it's coming over here to the House, we need to look at more in depth. Certainly, uh, it was not something that I was in favor of the way it was in the House. Mm -hmm. um, I'm open to taking a look, but certainly have my concerns and reservations about it. In the last minute, of course, you're taking a strong look at higher education reorganization in the state. How's, yep. that's moving, how's that moving along? It's moving moving along good. In fact, we've already filed some bills in the Senate that headed to committees, and what we're doing right now in that group is actually putting pieces of legislation out that is trying to do assistance to the student, some dollars to follow the students and help the students throughout their college career. And so that's encouraging, very difficult with the pressures on uh, higher education, but we are focused in on that in a bipartisan fashion, which is very encouraging. Representative Brady, thanks so much. We appreciate your time as always. Thank you very much for having me. Good thank, to be back. Thank you. Continuing our discussion on Illinois lawmakers about the budget making process with State Representative Fred Crespo of Hoffman Estates, Democrat, co-chairman of the Illinois Latino Legislative Caucus. He's also chair of the Appropriations uh, for General Services Committee in the state of Illinois and on um, the Education and uh, Curriculum and Policy Committee in right. the Illinois House. Good to have you on the program, well, thanks sir. Thanks for having me, Jack. Good being here. Um, this week, of course, uh, another leaders meeting here at the Capitol with uh, the four leaders and the governor, and it sounds like people are coming out of those meetings being somewhat cautiously optimistic that the deal is going to get done before the end of the, uh, the session on the 31st. Yeah, and I can tell you we've been meeting with the governor's office uh, in all four caucuses maybe for the last three weeks. Uh, 
And I think we're more optimistic now. We're moving directionally correct, which is a good term, I think. Uh, the problem is we haven't really drilled down to the weeds, and that's when things get a little bit complicated, right? Uh, so far, we've been going along with the assumptions that the governor has built into his budget. We haven't discussed those yet. Uh, I think when we get to that point, uh, there's going to be some hard debates going on as to whether we can go along with those assumptions and whether we can get 60 votes in the House and 30 votes in the Senate. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, as one of the budgeteers, you're taking a look at this at, at the line item level. You're going into really digging down and doing a deep dive on this thing. And with all the you know myriad uh, lines in this budget, the budget book is, weighs in about like this. Uh, that, is, that is no easy task. No, there's lots of review. We haven't really gotten down to that level. Usually we send that to the appropriation committees. Mm -hmm. We have five appropriation committees in the House, the Senate, they have two. And we'll go through that line by line. Right now, we're still working on that revenue estimate, and we've debated that over much. Um, and then we'll start talking about those above the line items. Those are the mandated fundings that we're required to do, a non discretionary spending. And that's when things get a little bit complicated, too, because that's going to determine how much money is left for the appropriation committees. We need to discuss debt service, how much are we going to debt service. We need to talk about uh, uh, Medicaid, how much we put in Medicaid. Uh, so there's so many other things that we still need to talk about and reach an agreement. I'll tell you this. It has been my experience in the past where we've agreed on a resolution with the revenue estimate. When we get to those above the line items, that's when things fall apart. And it's getting to that uh, that actual agreement on the the actual target number because that's sometimes that's sometimes a moving target. Uh, last year, when the budget was passed, uh, the uh, last budget didn't create as much money as we thought it would, and then later on there were some adjustments, and we were more or less back in the ballpark. Yeah, and that's been I think a point of contention this year. It seems like the Republicans made that revenue estimate an end game, and it is not. As you well pointed out, this is a dynamic number, right? We need to consider so many things. The governor uh, included, for example, the sale of the Thompson Center. Sure. And he did that last year. Uh, we were talking about the local distributor funds. That we cut 10% last year. So there's other things we need to talk about. We're also discussing po potentially looking at corporate loopholes. They can impact that number as well. Well, and there's another, there's a leftover from the budget impasse. There was a, like over a billion dollars in off the book spending that was done to keep prisons open open and health and human services, so they're looking for a supplemental there? Well, they're looking for a supplemental anywhere from $900 million to $1.2 billion. But here's, here lies the problem from, from our perspective, the Democrats. Most of that was spent without any appropriation authority, number one. Some of that, and I've been asking OMB to let us know how much of that is sitting with these vendor assistance programs. So is the pressure really there? Uh, so at this point, we are not even talking about the supplemental the, uh, right as of right now. And that's still that's still out there. Those those vendors are basically still waiting for their payments. They they sold food to the corrections department and services and the like, and that's all still kind of lumped in with that nearly seven billion dollars in the bill backlog, right? Yeah. Yeah, we haven't, something else just happened today. Uh -oh. uh, we had uh, Representative Jerry Costello pass the bill out of committee to pay the ask me, uh, what we owe ask me, which is like $63 million in back pay dating back to 2011. Uh, he tells me he already has over 80 yes votes in the House, and surely he's going to pass the Senate. We were not even talking about that pressure. And that's again sixty-three million dollars. So that's why that's why this whole thing still remains a moving target and so hard to nail down. Are you at this point? We're a couple of weeks before May thirty-first. I've been talking to some other folks today. There's still they're still optimistic that you can get the job done. Do you share in that optimism? Well, I think there's three different possible outcomes, right? Right. The ideal one would be that we somehow reach an agreement with the governor's office. We all hold hands together and we happily pass the budget with the governor's blessing and, and we're out of here in May. There's a second option, that is that we work with some Republicans that we have in the past and we pass a budget with them. And the third option is we pass a budget before the end of May with only 60 Democratic votes. So, you know, which means that we're gonna to have to come back because the governor's gonna veto it. But we don't know even if we reach an agreement if the governor's gonna veto this or not. Just look at what has happened before with the grand bargain in the Senate. We'll see.
We'll we'll just have to we'll just have to see yeah. over the next couple of weeks. Representative Fred Crespo, thanks so much for joining us on Illinois Lawmakers. Well, thanks, thanks for having me. Appreciate Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Thank you, Jack. Time now for an Illinois Senate perspective on the week's news here at the Illinois Capitol. Senate Appropriations 2 Committee Chairman Andy Menard, a Bunker Hill Democrat, joins us along with Senator Jill Tracy of Quincy, the Republican spokeswoman on the state Senate government, and the Telecommunications and Information Technology Committees. They join us now in Illinois Lawmakers. Thanks for uh, being here. I want to start off with a, a, an issue that is obviously uh, of concern to both of you. The uh, Quincy Veterans Home is in your district, and they're there was the uh, unfortunate situation with the Legionnaires' disease outbreak there. There's news this week that a new water supply is being found for the uh, Quincy Veterans Home. And there's also a, a bill, a capital bill, starting to go through the process here uh, to actually renovate and replace those buildings. Yes, yes. Um, you know, the first component was to find the best possible safe drinking water source. Uh, that has, you know, has been the problem uh, from the very beginning that uh, perhaps the water from the Mississippi is more uh, prone to the Legionella bacteria, which is found in all water sources, unfortunately. So uh, probably the, the best uh, idea was to do a new deep well and uh, the city of Quincy likewise is on that same water supply that's where the veterans homes water comes from and so it was a good joint effort to say you know the city will put in some money we'll get an IEP IPA grant and do a new water source which deep water wells have much less uh, prone to the Legionella bacteria. Mm -hmm. And of course the the campus there is quite old. Some of that dates back to the late 19th century right after we started taking care of uh, veterans of the Civil War. So there's now uh, what appears to be a standalone capital bill for the uh, uh, Quincy re basically replacing that whole campus. Uh, that came that came up this week. Was it kind of a surprise that it was going to be a, uh, dealt with that way, Senator Menard? No. Um, actually, Senator Tracy and I had a conversation about this yesterday oh, okay. on the Senate floor. Um, I commend her for filing the bill. I think it's a good step in the right direction. Um, I actually offered to uh, hold a public hearing so we can get the process started in the Senate. Um, I, I think it's a good move in the right direction. Obviously, there's um, matters dealing with how do we pay for it and, and what is the time frame on how to move forward, but I think that could be a productive conversation in the Senate. Well, that's that's uh, actually uh, uh, anticipates a couple of questions I was going to ask. Uh, in, in terms of that, um, where do you find a revenue stream uh, to, to actually pay for uh, something that could cost upwards of a quarter of a billion dollars? Well, uh, it's, it's paid from the Capital Development Fund, which means it would be bond proceeds. Uh, so the revenue source would have to be integrated into the budget uh, uh, construction of the budget, which is under underway right now right. between both sides of the aisle and both chambers. Uh, but this ought to be at the top of the list. And starting that conversation in the Senate, I think, would be a good step in the right direction. How many people are currently at, at the Quincy Veterans Home? About Something? 350, mm -hmm. which is a large population. And we recognize that we need to be there for future generations of uh, veterans, too. So um, I, this was a, bit of a bipartisan effort in mm -hmm. both chambers that have committed to helping us get whatever it takes. Once all eyes visited and understood the, the uniqueness of the sprawling Quincy Veterans Home being the flagship of our Veterans Home in Illinois. We'd, we were determined with our, our federal legislators and our state legislators wanted to continue that that tradition there and service to veterans. Talk about the timeline. Uh, you know, you're in the process of putting the legislation through and it's obviously a bipartisan effort to try to get get some movement on this. Uh, how soon before you break ground and what, uh, what do we do uh, to make sure that the uh, 350 or so veterans who are there and their families uh, are, in, are in good shape uh, in, the, in the interim. Well, they test water every day. Yeah. And right now with the new uh, introduction of what they call Paul filters, we're seeing a very minimal, if any, testing of, of once at the outlet of those filters of Legionellas, which is a very prime. Uh, we've also uh, taken steps to get a sycamore a nursing home that uh, is just a few blocks away that if there is a problem because uh, it's a sprawling campus and there's a lot of underground and so we're building over an existing plumbing and uh, 
perhaps tearing down old buildings. So uh, we may have to move some of those veterans. And then there's a long-term plan for the use of this sycamore for later uh, use. But I wanted to say also, it's very important to note that there is federal matching available. And our uh, Senator Durkin, Duckworth, and Congressman LaHood have very much committed to helping us access up to 55% or more of uh, federal funding for this project. So we would uh, be able to maximize that. What about the, uh, there's another nursing home that's been under construction for a while. The construction stopped up in the Chicagoland area. Is, is there any movement on trying to get that place uh, back under underway? Well, that, that should be part of the conversation too, Jack. And I, I think this underscores the nature and the need for capital construction across the state. Uh, whether it's for uh, these two particular homes or whether it's for any number of other things, uh, there's a pretty hefty list that's pending right now, and that should be part of the conversation as well. I saw a list the other day uh, from, a, from a group that studies this issue that said we probably ought to spend $31 billion a year just to keep pace with all the stuff, building schools, sure. repairing bridges, roads, and things like that. Is, is that, on the, is that uh, a discussion that's going to be taking place? I know it's late in this session, but I know that this is obviously something of concern to all lawmakers. Oh, I think, I think it's very much on both of our radars. I mean, we live in rural communities that very much have commuters. Public safety and economic development are uh, integral to uh, a capital plan. So I think uh, we'll see very much movement. As you say, it's late in this session. We've had enough to deal with, but I, I think very much um, We'll see that next session. Well, let's talk about, of course, all of this is wrapped up in the budget negotiations. There was a leaders meeting this week between the four legislative leaders and Governor Rauner. And uh, the word that at least we're hearing publicly that came out of that was very constructive. Uh, nobody was throwing anything at anybody that we can tell. Uh, so where are we towards getting a budget wrapped up by the end of the month, Senator Menard? Well, I would say the, the positive news uh, is I've spent more time with uh, my fellow budget negotiators than I have my family in the last two weeks. Uh, so, you know, that's a very big change from recent years. Nothing's going to get solved. There's going to be no compromise if people don't have face-to-face -face conversations. So that's happening. It's going to happen today for several hours, for example. Um, I'm hopeful that that's going to lead to some compromise proposal that could be called for a vote in the House and the Senate. It's not going to be not going to please everybody, right? These are tough choices that we have to make. Uh, the good news right now is that Democrats and Republicans are committed to those conversations that would, I think, eventually lead to a bipartisan budget. What are you hearing in your caucus on the Senate Republican side? Well, you know, same thing, that the, the, the budgeteers and the leaders are very much meeting. You know, it's been kind of quiet, but um, I place faith in, in our budgeteers and our leaders that they recognize that it, it's a, a, a short time frame and sometimes uh, pressure really yields good results. Well, there's, a, there's an old saying around here, if you don't hear anything, that's probably a good thing because if people are actually talking behind the, behind, the, behind the scenes and getting some things done. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion about, well, what revenue estimate are we going to use to nail this down? Are we getting closer to knowing uh, what that budget number is going to be? Well, there will be a uh, agreed upon revenue estimate. Um, what, what our position is in the Senate, among the Senate Democratic Caucus, is let's uh, present both the revenue estimate and the spending plan at the same time. Mm -hmm. Uh, they should they should match. It should be in balance, and that's how we should move forward. And at this point, you're looking at somewhere in the neighborhood of just under thirty eight billion dollars. Is that about right? Yeah, and, and you know, the, if if you dig down into it, uh, and minutia is important, of course, in budget making. But th there isn't that much disagreement between uh, the the legislative branch estimate versus the executive branch estimate versus partisan estimates between uh, Democrats and Republicans in the House and the Senate. Um, I, I think the 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 bigger focus is is the spending side, um, and and those two things should be presented in concert with each other. And, and what you're essentially doing behind the scenes is going through the line items on each, you know, of the literally, literally dozens, if not hundreds, of lines to go in there and figure out how is this going to meet our needs for fiscal year 2019 and beyond. Right. That's true. That's true. And there was a new wrinkle this week in the sense that there's a potential for a new revenue source for the state of Illinois, and that's sports betting. The U.S. Supreme Court uh, overturned state bans on sports betting uh, earlier this week. It's been an object of discussion here at the Capitol for the last couple of years. Uh, probably a little too early to factor that into getting it done before the end of the session. What are some of the, what are some of the considerations before Illinois uh, takes a plunge like that? Well, I, I, you know, from a budget making perspective, what I don't want to see is an overestimation of revenue. So for example, counting a number 
uh, as a result of the Supreme Court decision, I think would be premature. Uh, we want to make sure that we have a conservative revenue estimate that is agreed upon uh, because we don't want to base spending on revenues that aren't going to come through. So I'm taking a cautious approach with this one. Um, I think there'll be a time to do it, but I don't think the time uh, to count revenues for this is in the next two weeks. And of course, I, I think it's probably something that'll uh, most likely wait until fall or maybe even spring of next year to get everything lined up. Do you, do you agree with that? I do. I do. Um, you know, I think he's spot on is that in the past we've been too optimistic and, and we need to be cautious in that. And I, I did want to mention that uh, the school funding bill that we, we recently passed, uh, Senator Maher was a, a, the leader on that, the evidence-based funding. And we're hearing from our teachers that when they got that first uh, payment, uh, they, you know, it was like they never thought it would really happen. And uh, I see it as a real boost for rural education. Uh, we've we've fought for a long time to redo the formula, and because we felt like it, we were missing out. And um, our superintendents and principals are, are pretty happy yeah, with are. being able to plan a little bit, you know. And they're cautious in their planning because they they know that they're not sure exactly if it will keep coming as it uh, they hope. But uh, smaller classrooms and doing more with materials and adding staff has has really been a pleasure for them. And that was that was one of the best evidences of <laughs> examples of bipartisan yeah. true bipartisanship here. Congratulations to Senator well, Menard, Senator Berkman and everyone who uh, worked on this. Well, providing better education and serving our veterans are they're, they're not partisan issues, and so that part's easy. Right. Well, thank you so much. We appreciate your time. That's it for this edition of Illinois Lawmakers. We'll be back next week with continuing coverage of the spring session of the General Assembly here during the month of May.